Hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, very first live stream for our Entrepreneur Resorts uh, investor meeting. And we also have our earnings call today. I have Jeremy Harris on here with me, who is our CFO of Entrepreneur Resorts. Uh, hi, Jeremy. How are you doing today? Hi, Roger. Yeah, doing really well. Thank you. Great to be here. Very, very good. Good to have you here. Uh, we also had uh, Wes Christian, who uh, was... Um, not sure if he could make it exactly on time, but I see Wes has just joined us as well. So he may just be uh, tuning in. I I'm going to give him a second to, to, to see if he can um, uh, hear us or not. Hey, Wes, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, very, very good. Good to see you. Okay, thank you. I'm, and thanks for mm -hmm. making it. Um, what, what I'm going to do just to, uh, uh, just to kick it off is to let everyone know that uh, I'm actually uh, filming this from our... Uh, Bali retreat, which is one of our resorts. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to explain to people exactly what an entrepreneur retreat is. But just to give you all an idea, uh, you can see that here in this room, we have got uh, a lot of activity going on. And the reason for that is because we are about to start the fifth day of one of the accelerator programs that's going to be taking place in here. Uh, so we have about 100 people that are here working on their businesses from all over the world. Uh, from Japan, Australia, <clears throat> uh, Africa, uh, Europe, and uh, um, other uh, parts of the world. Uh, we have got uh, contingents that come in from different places. Uh, you can see basically where all of their biographies are. Uh, and down here uh, is very early in the morning here, which is why uh, there are some people upstairs uh, in the yoga pavilion. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we are uh, waiting in about an hour's time. Everyone is going to be here uh, for this program. Each of these programs will do maybe a million dollars plus in revenues and at the same time um, support entrepreneurs around the world who go back with their business plans um, and basically uh, build uh, their businesses over the next years. Uh, and that's really what it is to be part of Entrepreneur Resorts really is making sure um, that we are giving people a great uh, opportunity to connect with each other globally uh, and do it uh, in a paradise location. Uh, so with that said, uh, let me share very briefly what we're going to be covering uh, on this call. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to be uh, coming straight over uh, to Wes for an update. Wes will be with us for uh, the first 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then after that, we'll be getting on with the rest of our uh, investor call. But to give everyone an overview of what we're going to be covering, mm -hmm. first thing that I want to share uh, is the agenda. Uh, we have got uh, quite a lot we want to cover on the call. Uh, the very first thing is the legal activity taking place. Um, obviously, uh, in the midst of the spin-off process that we have just gone through uh, with Genius Group, uh, there has been a history of uh, activity in terms of both uh, Genius Group and now Entrepreneur Resorts, uh, really making sure that we want to be protecting all of our shareholders' interests. Um, uh, we are both uh, uh, um, companies that are, are publicly traded. Uh, the one in, um, uh, in the US, uh, Genius Group, is on the uh, NYC American. And then obviously now there's been this spinoff for uh, Entrepreneur Resorts, which is on Merge uh, and now the Upstream Exchange. Uh, we are going to, after that, go over an overview of Entrepreneur Resorts for all of our new investors, together with our uh, first half earnings report. That's where we're going to bring Jeremy on board and also the financial guidance for the full year and the future growth plans. So for all the investors who have joined us, you're going to get a very clear idea, I believe, of exactly what our business is about. And we're also going to give you an update on the share count uh, because that was all part of the process uh, that we had on the uh, count date, which was the 31st of August uh, of this year as well. Um, on the legal side, I do want to be um, uh, saying a few things, first of all, uh, to be uh, very clear between Entrepreneur Resorts and uh, Genius Group. Obviously, um, I'm the CEO of both groups, but I am here 100% uh, in my capacity as CEO uh, of Entrepreneur Resorts. So nothing that I'm saying uh, related to Genius Group is going to be in the official capacity of Genius Group. Uh, we're going to uh, be uh, only speaking very fleetingly about it in how it's in context of Entrepreneur Resorts. Uh, but otherwise, everything that we're covering is very much for our Entrepreneur Resorts shareholders post spinoff. Um, also, as I uh, have put here, our focus is to ensure that we take all the legal and structural measures possible to uh, make sure that we're protecting the interests of all our shareholders. So we are very uh, avidly following uh, the work that Wes Christian and his team, uh, who obviously have been uh, hired by Genius Group, along with many other companies, uh, what progress that they have been taking. And I know a lot of our investors, if not all the our investors, are also very interested to know what other developments 
um, that have been taking place as well. And of course, this is a week by week, month by month um, activity that takes place, which is why with uh, some of the things that Wes is able to share, uh, I wanted him to be able to come on board and give all of our investors an update um, on where things are at at the moment and what progress is also being made. Um, so with that, Wes, I'd love to come over to you and give you an opportunity to mm. just share with all of our investors what have been the, the latest progress, because I know there's been a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Honored to be here, Roger, and to talk to all of your shareholders, officers, directors, and constituents. So as everyone knows, uh, approximately six, seven months ago, we were hired by Genius to look into essentially, has there been any type of market manipulation in their securities? And in doing so, you know, we looked at naked short selling allowance, uh, na naked short selling uh, footprints, uh, spoofing analysis, uh, stock lending analysis, and, and various things that we look at in connection with uh, what, what I would consider common market manipulation schemes. We're probably a month to two months from finishing all that. Uh, I can't get into specifics about that other than to tell you it, it generally has gone extremely well. Um, and, and once I think we're finished with it in a month to two months, then I think you'll be able to see something publicly uh, that, that we will be able to disclose. So at, at that point, you know, it'll be up to the board to decide what direction we go. Uh, but I can tell you in general, that this litigation space, which is the market manipulation of public companies, is making substantial progress in every front. So what are those fronts? Well, first, let's talk about uh, just what's in the Southern District of New York. There are now four cases pending uh, and, and several more to be filed in the Southern District of New York. One of those, of course, is Harrington. Uh, we've already beat the motion to dismiss on that. And secondly, uh, the court issued an opinion that basically um, is groundbreaking uh, in, in, in substance. What did the opinion say? The opinion said that not only are brokers now going to be liable for their own illegal activity, which would include lending stock they don't have, selling shares they don't deliver, buying shares for their clients that they don't uh, buy in the opposing, the, the, the counterparty to the trade, these type of things. It will also include uh, holding a broker responsible for their customers' illegal trades. So what that means is, is if they're doing things through dark pools, they're doing things through uh, direct market access machines, which is typically done cross-border, or they're doing things in X clearing or other ways that ultimately uh, facilitates a customer using their platform, their broker's license, if you will, through which they run trades that have some illegal aspect to them. If that broker has been reckless in not supervising those trades, which we strongly believe will be, that will be the case in most instances, then they are now liable for all of it. So what that means is a broker is no longer just liable based on this new law, and, and this is case law, not statutory law, they're liable for their own illegal activity, and now they're liable for their own customers' illegal activity. That, that expands exponentially the damages, and we believe that that's going to create an enormous amount of additional accountability. Um, that case is moving forward in discovery. Another case, Northwest Bio, that you probably have followed. Again, Cohen Milstein is, is the lead on that. I'm, I'm helping them in that case. It's really my client that I brought to Cohen Milstein, Northwest Biotherapeutics, who's been my client for five years. A tremendous company um, uh, basically has uh, neobastoma uh, uh, immunotherapy that is, it is incredible if you go read up on it. Uh, but basically, uh, that case, that motion to dismiss has been filed. That hearing is in November. Uh, we're you know, cautiously optimistic we'll prevail on that. Uh, Cohen Milstein, on their own, has filed another case called Funware, P-H-U-N-W-A-R-E. And there's another case, G-T-I-I, which is our case. And I, I can't get into what the other cases I believe will be, but there will be several. And you could imagine what one of those might be. <laughs> so in any event, uh, I will tell you that, that uh, the courts are now understanding what's going on in this. 
They understand that it's it's much larger than than you know Wall Street says it is. Of course, I've been saying for years it is systemic. It's the biggest commercial fraud I believe in, in U.S. history, and we now know it's global. Uh, I've given some other podcasts you may have been on, and actually posted some of the evidence of fails to deliver you know, in Europe, and the, the numbers are staggering. We know that uh, essentially every client we have uh, is having trades come out of Germany and other foreign exchanges. Uh, we have a separate group that's looking at that because it's enormously complex, so I can't tell you with specificity uh, how that's going to impact everything, but I can tell you it's being done on a very large scale. My belief is, is that those uh, those trades in, in other parts of the country are principally being done by U.S. companies, U.S. Uh, the broker dealers and U.S. hedge funds and others. That's my belief. I can't prove that at this point. Uh, but we ultimately will go discover that all the way down to the source. Uh, and in addition to that, I can tell you that I've met with many, many uh, the lawyers for various congressmen and senators. Uh, the United States Congress is all over this. The Senate is all over this, although the, the Congress, the Financial Services Committee is taking the lead. They're mainly using uh, MMTLP as the, as the flag that they're waving, but ultimately it impacts everything, including Genius and, and other companies. Um, the SEC, of course, has come out with some new transparency disclosure rules regarding beneficial ownership. And while I applaud the SEC for including, you know, in essence, disclosure of short sales and other things that fit within a certain box, it still doesn't fix the problem of selling something you don't deliver or rehypothecating the same share multiple times in the form of lending stock that you don't have. So until those two things are stopped, uh, essentially, the new rules just require the perpetrators to disclose their positions, uh, but ultimately it doesn't stop the carnage, in my view. It does make it easier to find, but it doesn't stop it. So uh, what I was explaining to Roger and I tell everyone is now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, as shareholders of, of uh, this company, uh, as shareholders of any public company, to rise up, write your congressman, write your senator, Write your attorney general. Uh, I believe there's a group of attorney generals ultimately that will weigh in on this at some level. We, we saw that early on back in 2005, uh, where the Association of Attorney Generals uh, finally said, you know, we, we have to get involved in this too because the people in our respective states are getting screwed. Uh, and how are they getting screwed? Their pension funds are getting raided. Their IRAs are getting raided you know, the, their their fortunes are getting raided. And so uh, ultimately this impacts us all. So in my view, uh, between the Reddit group, the MMTLP group, Roger and his uh, the incredible group of CEOs that are fighting this as a group, uh, the Wall Street Bets group, the Super Stock group, now the Congress and, and now the SEC is acknowledging there's there's an issue. Uh, including recent enforcement actions against Citadel. Go look at that one where they were mismarking billions of shares, uh, if I read the uh, enforcement action properly, uh, marking them long when it was short. Um, and the same thing for Goldman and others. There have been uh, multiple enforcement actions on the civil side that, that have been accomplished on top, of course, the criminal prosecution of the Morgan uh, traders uh, at relative to spoofing the metals market. So in summary, I would say uh, all of this litigation is going well. Uh, we are closing in on finishing that for genius and that will culminate hopefully in something very positive. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, we are optimistic, we're steadfast and continue to be committed to this space, including increasing our bench increasing the number of law firms that are being involved in this and, and are now taking notice of this and wanting to jump in and help both to you know take something that's wrong and make it right, but also financially rewarding down the road, hopefully once we make some of these people pay similar to how we, we've done in the past. So that's my summary and I'm happy Roger to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Wes, for that. And uh, yeah, I've got a, a few questions for you. And, and there was also a question that's already come in from the group. And if there's anyone else who has any questions um, you want to ask, we'll, we'll try and take a few before we move on with the rest of the meeting. Uh, for me, it, it really for coming in, first of all, as someone who didn't really have clarity at all um, about uh, the depth of, of what you're talking about and have had to get a very quick um, uh, uh, education on it, like earlier this year and then through the year. I think there's two things I'd really love for you to be able to address. The first one is why it takes half a year or more, right, to basically go through uh, and 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 to be able to do the the information uh, um, digging that's needed, uh, and the relationship between uh, the 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 lack of transparency in the market. Because obviously, if we could all see exactly who was shorting, you know, who was basically buying, uh, we could all see exactly where there might be issues. But because it is so difficult to get this information. Um, you know, a, a company would hire yourselves. You would not be able to get into the depth of it unless there's actually been an actual suit that's been uh, 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 put. And you can't put that suit unless you have the details. So it's chicken and egg to get to it. So you have certain ways that you're going about looking at the information. Um, the fact that the transparency becomes less because of all the international trades as you've seen, and you've seen, you've been collecting a lot of great information about that. Someone's had a question about dark pools. So that's also been a huge growth in America compared to in some other countries where, where it's limited. Um, so, so just the transparency challenge and, and the reason it takes so long to get there. But then the second thing adding to that, uh, because I think a lot of people may not appreciate just how massive this Harrington's case um, judgment is, because basically what it is saying is if you have a broker dealer that's that's actually placing trades, uh, whether or not they know whether or not they they are wrong or right, the fact that they have no liability or or didn't think they had liability on that, and now the court is actually saying, well, actually, uh, we think that you do or you may. Uh, the fact that that means that the discovery process will become so much easier once you get to that point where there is enough to actually pull the case. So the chicken and egg, the transparency issue, uh, how it's getting worse, not better in some cases. Uh, and basically, you know, your part as a lawyer working with companies and shareholders uh, to ensure that you can basically move things forward and how this Harrington's case actually makes that hopefully easier going forward as well. Sure. So the best way I can explain to you why it takes so long is to give you a one minute chronology of, of what's happened. So starting in 2000, when the NSCC was purchased by the DTC, that's when stock lending went through the roof, right? And so from there, we then it took us a couple of years in the old days to figure out, you know, how this is being done. Frankly, I didn't know. Uh, um, and so once we figured that out, we went to the SEC, we went to others, we hired a lobbyist, even a group of lawyers and others. The attorney generals joined us, the Chamber of Commerce joined us in the United States and said, hey, this needs to get fixed. So that culminated in Reg Show. Reg show only applies if the, if the trading ticket, if you will, is marked short. If it's marked long, then the, then the machines don't pick it up. So what <laughs> the first day that Reg show that had published data, January 1 of 2005, I'm sitting at my desk and there's, there's an endless number of companies on that list, okay? <laughs> but over time, I started saying, my God, there, there, there's less and less companies. What's going on? Well, guess what's going on? They started marking the tickets long, okay? So the theme of this story that I'm going to burn through is hide, 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 hide. Stay in the dark, stay in the dark, stay in the dark. Move it somewhere else, move it somewhere else. That's the simple version. But essentially from there, they started marking it uh, long when it was short. Even now, even now, they're still doing the same thing. Go look on the SEC website if you're listening and go look on the FINRA website how many hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, they've been fined for marking, mismarking tickets. You either mark it short, long, or exempt, okay? It would shock your conscience to understand how many times they've done it, and they're still doing it. Then secondly, they go to the options market. They take a put, a put contract, a large one, 50,000 shares, put it with a, put it with a, a call contract. That never gets consummated. That was the second way. So, so that, that didn't work. We discovered that. Then the third way was, well, let's see, uh, take the fails to deliver and hide them in subsidiaries and do it offshore, okay? So, so ultimately, we found that, and that didn't work. And then the next thing you know, they, they sell it here and bifurcate the obligation to deliver over in London or somewhere else under a repo agreement. So we figured that out. 
So, so that's no longer. Next thing you know, they go to market makers, which market makers really didn't seem to participate in this that much until the last you know five, six, seven years. Now, because that's one of the, you know, we, we and, and incidentally, our group, along with the SEC and others, closed a bunch of loopholes in Reg Show along the way. For example, they grandfathered all the original fails where we knocked that out. They didn't have an anti-fraud provision. That got passed, et cetera. But the one loophole that exists that, that is responsible for a lot of this carnage, in my view, uh, is the bona fide market maker exception is being abused. So they're hiding in that. But ultimately, if you go look at the lawsuit from Northwest Bio, guess who's being sued? Citadel. Go look at some of the other suits, Virtue. And so these market makers ultimately, I believe, are going to get sued more and more because I believe in many instances, I'm not going to say in all, they're not bona fide market makers. If your sell side of your book is 70 percent and your buy side is 30 percent, you're not a bona fide market maker. And then guess what? If I get to include all the tickets they mismarked in their recent enforcement action, God knows what the number is, okay? Because again, it's about learning the truth, not lies that are perpetrated. All of this, this whole scheme is about disseminating false information. We would call it in Texas lying and disseminating that lie to the marketplace. That's what all this whole case is about. So at the end of the day, they then say, okay, well, we got caught at that, so let's go offshore. Let's go start trading from outside the country. They did that in, in small batches back in the early days, but now it's systemic in my view. From the you know, again, we've reviewed hundreds and hundreds of millions of pages of documents over this 21 years, and a lot of that stuff is being reviewed now. Is coming from other countries. I'm like, oh my god, and then I get some information that makes me feel like can't prove it that a lot of that is coming from U.S. companies. <laughs> It's not Germans doing it to us. It's our own people. Good God. So, and, and Wes, and then, just, and, and, just on that. So I think, so everyone um, who is an investor here is also clear. Uh, there is uh, obviously, you know, reports that come up on, you know, failures to deliver, which is obviously a sign where someone has sold something short and then has nothing to cover it with. Um, can you share with everyone the difference of what you know, the likes of um, you know Finra, BTC, and others can can track what the SEC is looking at, or or what gets published in terms of failures to deliver in the U.S. Uh, versus what happens if this takes place overseas, and the reason it's so easy to hide this in a, such a way you never see it on a report. Well, uh, the number well, there's several ways, but but first, let's start with there's very few rules against naked short selling or prohibiting that in in these foreign countries. Now, you go to some place like Korea and other places that are prohibited, that, that, that's ongoing. So believe it or not, there are a few countries that are banning it, okay? And, but, but for the most part, that's just now catching on. But it's also hard to find because a lot of this is done ex-clearing. Don't forget, not all shares trade through the DTC. They trade also ex-clearing. Ex-clearing means I call it a different set of books, broker to broker, this place to that place. And it's done directly. And it, that doesn't leave an audit trail. You can only get that in discovery. So that's another way to hide it. Trying to clear it through someplace else is another way to hide it. So uh, again, what you have to find is what, what are all the intersections and ways they can do this, okay? Um, and, and that takes enormous time, enormous time. Even with all of our proprietary systems, and we have a bunch of them, and even with David Winger and Share Intel, that you've used in your case and we use in every case, even with Tom Ronk's data, uh, which we use almost in every case, et cetera, et cetera, it's still enormously complex because you're looking at multiple intersections of data to digest and then cross-reference it and create these comparisons that are endless to catch the disparities. And then where do the disparities come from? You have to trace it back. And then ultimately figure out, okay, how has that damaged the company, et cetera, et cetera. So frankly, the, the, it taking five or six months with all the complexities and the various ways that they can hide this and mischaracterize it from what it really is, uh, is, is fast, okay? And then the cases take long also because these people are not stupid. They passed the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act in the late, late 90s. It says until you beat the motion to dismiss, if you're suing under 10B5 market manipulation, you don't get any discovery. 
Well, that's that in the old days hurt us. In fact, frankly, the first several cases in New York that we filed, they weren't that successful because we didn't know how to go find this on our own. We had to learn it, as I say, the school of hard knocks. And I say we, I'm, I'm talking about all of our experts too. We have the best experts I've ever worked with in my life in this space. But it is a long journey. It's a tough journey. Uh, but I will tell you, it's getting easier. And more importantly, the awareness of it being in, in existence is now really coming to the forefront. And kudos to you, Roger, for, for helping lead that charge, you know, in the CEO level. And, and, and all the other CEOs that frankly are, are putting their own uh, you know, reputations and their, and their money and their uh, uh, you know, wherewithal at risk and, 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 and you know, going against the, the, the tidal wave that's out there. Uh, but that's what it takes in order sometimes to snuff out something that's evil. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. And, and there was two other questions that came through off the back of this as well. Uh, and, you, you know, you made it clear why it takes so long um, and why it's so difficult to get information before a case is actually filed. Uh, you know, uh, w when you file the case, there was one question, which is, look, are there potential criminal charges, right, that that could be done, you know, by ERL or other companies as well? Um, it would be great if you could share about that, that everything you're talking about is really civil. It's about companies or investors, um, you know, paying uh, your firm or firms like yourselves to actually go after um, those out there. And the most that can happen with that, obviously, is fines um, or or settlements out of uh, a set settlement out, out, out of um, the actual kind of like rulings. And I'd love for you to just share uh, because you can't do it specifically in many cases, you know, where you've had great success at actually being able to, you know, get results for investors, uh, but how almost all of them are out of court and they are happening as a result of almost, you know, these um, companies taking this as a cost of business, right? It's like, well, we'll just pay it instead of going all the way to court on it. Um, but but that really could take several years to go, but but that's the real focus. Um, but how that then links also with uh, the, 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 the illegal side, like, you know, the Department of uh, Justice, where there are uh, actions now that are taking uh, place as well, um, where you do have uh, the, those prosecutions that, that are potential in the future as well. Well, <clears throat> here's what I can tell you. Um, in some cases, we were able to bring uh, the, the uh, market manipulation scheme under state law. And, and what we did is we picked states that had a civil RICO statute. And in those cases, ultimately, the same predicate acts that give rise to civil RICO gave rise to criminal RICO. Uh, in fact, if we go look, we were involved in Operation Bermuda Short. We were involved uh, with the uh, arrest of Thomas and Andreas Badian. We were involved uh, with REFCO, which went down, uh, uh, and, and some other you know, DOJ uh, uh, prosecutions. I will tell you, in my view, the DOJ has been reluctant to go after this, but now I think they're getting a lot of pressure, not because of one administration versus another, but from the public, from the public, from, the, from the, the Department of Justice seeing that the public is being raped and pillaged by this illegal practice. And it's not only you know, raiding their pension funds, it's killing technology, it's killing jobs, it's killing innovation, it's killing things that can make our life better. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the totality of that and the magnitude of that coming to the forefront puts pressure on them. So I predict totally speculation that you're going to see more criminal prosecutions. And yes, some of the very things that we're talking about uh, uh, can, and, and the evidence we have can come into play as, as a criminal prosecution, potentially. I'm not a criminal lawyer. I know the burden of proof is much more, uh, much different there, okay? Uh, we, you know, civil is a preponderance of the evidence and criminal is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a higher standard. But, but I think when somebody does it to you, um, 900 days in a row every day, every trading day, that is probably intentional, right? So uh, I think you're going to see more of that as time goes on. Uh, but, but most of these cases, yes, it's true. They haven't gone to trial. My belief is they don't want their, their executives testifying under oath, and then they're guilty of perjury. But I don't know. Uh, yes, most of the, the, the things are, are uh, settlements are confidential. I know a piece of Overstock 2 was, wasn't confidential, a piece of Overstock 1 wasn't confidential, but the taser gun case and other cases where, let's just say we were happy with the outcome, uh, All you're right, all of those are confidential. And honestly, 
as a lawyer, ethically, I cannot interfere. If the client wants to settle, I have to settle. I, I can't stop a settlement because it would be unethical for me to do so. So while I have input on it, the client controls how that happens, plain and simple. That, thank you, Wes. A final question, uh, uh, which uh, because obviously we have all of our investors and our, you know, our investor base in entrepreneur resorts is, is you know, equal, obviously, to uh, what Genius had at the end of October. And one of the biggest things here is that, you know, when you look at a lot of the cases you bring, often the actual, you know, damages model that you that you calculate with your team, it can be in the multiples of the actual market cap of the company itself if the company has been pushed down. And so it's almost like a touch and go for the company, right? Like if the investors all bail on the company, then the company can go bust, which obviously would be of great benefit to the illegal traders. So they never have to actually cover um, if they support it and take a long term view, even though it can be difficult, the benefits can be huge, right? So um, anything you want to say just about that from the point of view of both CEOs and investors as to how yeah. they should be looking at this going forward? It's so critical they support the company. I can tell you that I believe the, the, the game plan of the bad guys is to take it to zero and put it in bankruptcy. And this has happened in multiple cases where ultimately the bankruptcy judge with the stroke of a pen cancels all the equity because it's worthless because it's secured credit, various classes of secured creditors, various classes of unsecured creditors, and the equity holders are typically you know, at the bottom or close to the bottom. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, that lets the bad guys win. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, the company needs support because frankly, if every, any case ever goes to trial and you're, and you're, you know, you're, you're teetering on bankruptcy, that ultimately is probably going to come into evidence because the, the bad guys, of course, expert is going to say, well, here are the real reasons the company stock went down. Look at the company. And so if the company's not adequately supported, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, hell, he's only standing on two toes. There's only two toes left on his stance, right? And so uh, th ultimately, they're, they would be allowed to get that admitted into evidence, in my view. And so the, the support of the company is critical, and, and the support of the cause is critical. Th th this, is, this is bigger than any of us. It's bigger than money. It's bigger than one company. This is about our capital markets. And frankly, uh, uh, you know, is, is the U.S. going to survive? <laughs> financially as it, you know, as a nation, as it relates to what's going on in these markets, it's, you can't, you can only take on so much poison before the tree dies. Right. And so um, I submit the, the trillions and trillions of dollars that's been taken out of this is, is poison. And it's going to continue to, to, you know, continue to get, go get more. Look at Suzanne Trimbass last posting. If you go to her Twitter, you know, the fails are more now, uh, according to NSCC, than they were pre-reg show. I mean, uh, the, the, the pre-reg show, yeah. So, you know, is it working? Uh, I'd say not. It's really not. So is it getting better as far as awareness and, and more lawsuits and more? Yes, it is. Uh, people now realize that, that there's something really at stake here and it's large. So we better deal with it. And so that's good. Wes, I want to say a big, big thank you for making the time to come here. I know you had a very busy schedule, so I really, really appreciate it. Uh, please, uh, everyone, uh, investors, uh, give some love to Wes in the in the comments. And um, Wes, uh, we will continue to support all of your efforts and uh, look forward to seeing all the developments in the months ahead. I, I'm much. counting on I'm counting on you being the fellow warrior that I know you are. Okay, absolutely. Thank you very much, and, and, okay, and my best to all of you. All right, bye bye. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Um, and 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 I really want to just make that point as well. The reason that I wanted to have Wes on here, um, you know, earlier uh, in the year, we also had him on one of our uh, investors' calls. Uh, while Entrepreneur Resources part of Genius Group, um, I just want to be very clear to everybody that you know my interest uh, in really seeing uh, justice, support, transparency for all investors. This is not me being the CEO of a particular company. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm here on on a meeting here or in any other company that I'm involved in. Um, it's a personal uh, thing. I think I know it is for Wes as well. Um, I think that uh, I'm an investor as well as a CEO. Right? And for me, it's really, really important that we actually have a way to have a, a, a fair playing field for all of us, right? So I do want to make that point um, and, and I'll continue to shine a light on this uh, wherever I happen to show up. Uh, and with that, um, I want to get more into um, now the rest of the presentation for Entrepreneur Resorts. I think one of the very important things uh, about what we're even doing with Entrepreneur Resorts is making sure that the one thing a CEO can do is make sure 
that their companies are protected and more importantly, that they're healthy, that they're growing. Um, and you're going to see as a result of the earnings details we're going to give you shortly, um, that Entrepreneur Resource also has been impacted by a lot of the activity that's taken place, uh, but is really now on a very, very strong growth trajectory, uh, protecting its shareholders. Uh, and it's also growing in terms of um, how it's thinking about its future as well and where it's being listed. Um, so let me go straight into the next step, which is the spin-off process. So the spin-off process uh, that you all were involved in, uh, it was uh, basically started in January, um, and it has gone all the way through from the board approval, shareholder approval that took place, all the way through to court order and SEC filing. The court order actually is public record. It's uh, with the Singapore High Court. Uh, anyone can go apply for it, get that. That's a 253-page document, uh, which actually shows exactly what uh, we uh, gave to the courts for them to approve. Um, the shareholder, uh, uh, they, the reason they have a court order is the way it works in Singapore, and and uh, both companies are related to Singapore companies. Uh, Genius Group itself is a Singapore-based company, uh, which is publicly listed in the US, um, and Entrepreneur Resource also has a Singapore-based company, as well as it being uh, based at the um, head office in uh, Seychelles. And one thing very important uh, about the Singapore court is they want to make sure that any spinoff is beneficial to uh, shareholders, right? And so the details are in there about what happened at the time of that spinoff. We had a record date, 31st of August, uh, which then led to uh, the merge um, uh, uh, shifting to upstream listing. Um, so there was already a merge uh, listing that had taken place back in 2017. Uh, and then Entrepreneur Resource had been acquired uh, prior to the IPO of Genius Group by Genius Group. Uh, and now it's being spun off uh, and during that whole process, it kept all of its own management team, its own board, uh, its own operations separate, uh, but within the group. And so it was quite a simple process to then spin it back out again. Um, and then we have had the distribution of shares uh, pretty much from uh, end of August um, into where we actually had the full spin-off in September. So these are basically the steps. If anyone has not yet received your shares, please go ahead and follow the process. Uh, we now are listed on uh, the Upstream Exchange, which is a blockchain-based exchange. Uh, I want to make it very clear, it's not a cryptocurrency. Uh, it is not um, anything to do with the crypto side. I know there's a lot of scrutiny on um, Upstream, but simply by saying it is on the blockchain, what that means is that it's very easy for you to actually track and see your shares. Uh, it's, very, um, impos it's actually impossible for someone to short your shares, uh, and it's also uh, impossible for someone to, failure, to fail to deliver uh, because it is basically, you know, zero time transactions. Uh, and uh, there's every possibility that, you know, more and more exchanges in the future will also go this way because it does provide full transparency. Uh, for everyone who has uh, received your ERL shares, you, you will be able to see them uh, on the platform. Um, if you have not yet, download the Upstream app, sign up. Uh, I want to just give you a very um, simple way of being able to actually see uh, the details um, as we go, right? So basically, if I was to um, uh, go to the Entrepreneur Resorts uh, page, you'll see on here under investors, uh, you can go to investors and you actually have got here the instructions, first of all, um, on how you go about uh, uh, downloading the app, um, requesting uh, for your shared distribution. Uh, so it goes through that detail. There's also all of the FAQs for all of the questions you might have. Uh, around basically how the um, shares operate. And there's also uh, you know, a very simple step-by-step -step here, uh, which you can follow as well. And our team is here to support you as well. So um, if you haven't yet done that, please make a note to do that uh, because basically we do want as many of our um, shareholders to make sure you are taken care of as possible. Uh, and with that, let me just uh, jump right into the whole process uh, by which we launched Entrepreneur Resorts, why uh, it is growing the way it's growing at the moment. Uh, and basically, for those of you who see yourself as long-term investors with us, uh, what we see happening for our future um, as well. So as a starting point, uh, the whole concept of Entrepreneur Resorts was originally inspired by a visit that I had to Necker Island back in 2015. Uh, that was where I was on an entrepreneur retreat with Richard Branson, uh, and I saw just how much he had designed his entire island uh, as a place where he could uh, enjoy uh, a great environment while at the same time, brainstorming, strategizing with other entrepreneurs, connecting with others as well to co-create the future. Uh, one of the things that Richard Branson did was he created something called the temple, which is where he brought together the elders. The elders included people like Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, people who basically were there brainstorming and thinking about the future of humanity, where we're going, uh, how we can actually come up with a, a better 
uh, and more effective way for us all to be able to contribute to the future of the world. So that was really the very beginning part to say, well, if you can do that in Necker Island, surely you can do that in other parts of the world as well, where you're not just going as a tourist resort, but you're going because you've got an opportunity to meet like-minded people that care about the future as well. Where that's now evolved to is we now have six locations that have grown around the world. In the time that Entrepreneur Resource was under Genius Group, there was no growth. And now the reason for that is because Genius Group's uh, leadership team and management team was very focused at the ed tech and education side, whereas Entrepreneur Resource um, has a hospitality focus. Uh, now that we basically have spun off, uh, we are going fully back on the Entrepreneur Resource side to growth as a result of uh, our license model that we have. Um, so we have a total of six different locations. Uh, I'm right now at our Vision Villa Resort in Bali, Indonesia. We also have got two other locations in Bali. One is a Genius Cafe Ganya. One is a Genius Cafe, which is on the beach uh, in Sanoa. It's actually in partnership with Mercure Hotel. So our ability to do partnerships with hotels and instead of having a business center uh, underneath the lobby, which is what tends to happen in a lot of hotels uh, with no windows, uh, we have actually got one which is on the beach, uh, watching sunsets, uh, having margaritas, and at the same time, being able to actually co-work uh, and listen to great speakers come and share their experiences of building their businesses. Um, we also have got a Genius Central Singapore, which is where we have brought the same concept of healthy food, of co-learning, of uh, co-working, -co and bring it into uh, the center um, of a city. Uh, think of this as an anti-WeWork. Uh, a WeWork model is one in which you pay a lot of money for your table uh, space or your desk space. Uh, uh, and then after that, you might get free beer. In our case, we actually give the uh, table space for free, uh, but we charge for the uh, drinks. Uh, and it turns out that entrepreneurs tend to pay a lot more for their drinks than they do for their table. Uh, we also have got the Tau Game Lodge in South Africa and also the Matla Game Lodge, which is a members only game lodge that's there as well. Um, so this allows us, and if you're interested in actually seeing what these models look like, because in each case, we have got a license model that we're actually following off the back of this as well. Um, this, in, this enables everybody uh, in any country uh, to be able to actually convert their current cafe uh, or their current um, uh, uh, a program, wherever they happen to be, uh, and bring it basically into uh, the platform that we have as well. So you'll find that every one of these different programs, wherever they happen to be, uh, they have got also uh, their own uh, website. So for example, if we were to go and look for um, the uh, the Matla Game Lodge, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can search for any of these um, yourselves as well, but you'll be able to find them quite uh, easily. Uh, this here is uh, the Matla Game Lodge, which is um, at the Midikri, uh Safari Park. Uh, you can see here uh, that basically it is a perfect place for different programs to be run. There is safaris uh, every day uh, that also take place. Um, so this basically is a private lodge for all of our members. Um, and then we also have got the Tao Game Lodge, which is a 30 chalet uh, lodge with a lake outside where you get to basically have your 24-7 Discovery Channel taking place uh, while you're actually running your programs um, off the back of it as well. We have conservation programs that take place at our safari lodges. Uh, we have programs supporting the local communities that take place uh, within our Bali programs and similarly in Singapore as well. Uh, we just had a um, turtle hatching uh, program uh, on the beach that took place in uh, in Bali. Uh, and the whole point of this is that if we're able to be creating wealth in different parts of the world, as well as contributing, um, then it means that uh, there are going to be communities all around the world that are going to be welcoming our lodges uh, to be part of their programs as well. So continuing on with the uh, uh, picture of what we are doing, everything comes down to three models. Each of them are licensed models. So we have the smallest one, which is Genius Cafe. Uh, the Genius Cafe model in Bali, it got to profitability within its first year. It generates over a million dollars in uh, revenues a year. Genius Central is larger than that. Genius Central can be in several millions of dollars uh, and basically is, uh, is a cafe co-working space, uh, which then leads to the resort model, which is multiple millions of dollars. And all of them, because we are effectively uh, bringing on board a, a retreat model, uh, to what people are willing to pay to actually stay, our yield per customer is quite a lot higher than uh, competing resorts in the same neighborhood as well. And we've designed each of these as a license model, which means that we can now convert other cafes, uh, co-working spaces, and resorts um, into our brand and then connect them to the different retreats uh, and accelerators that we're now running around the world. Uh, for example, I was just sharing here, uh, we have got about 100 people here. 
uh, from around the world on our masters. We are now running AI labs uh, where we basically are having accelerated programs for people to integrate AI into their programs and they can do that from Bali or in South Africa. Uh, and then here we also have got uh, the massive growth that's taking place in our primary market, which we call digital nomads. So digital nomads have gone from 2017, just a few million to now 2022, over 35 million people around the world. That's like a massive growth. Uh, the reason for that is because of something called the great resignation, where many people decided instead of working, uh, being in Russia every day in a the city, they would much prefer uh, to be working on their own company. Uh, and they found those smarter and smarter ways that they could actually have a digital business where they can travel anywhere uh, and connect with people all around the world. So we cater for that market. Uh, and hospitality itself is also growing dramatically uh, as you can see on the graph on the right, uh, as a result of the post-pandemic roaring 20s that we're in at the moment, where people are uh, spending money um, on their travel, uh, and they want to actually make sure their travel is something that also um, is going to be um, uh, 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 both tax deductible, which it is if you are on a business retreat, as well as uh, something which is going to be able to improve their ROI on every dollar they spend, because they're actually building a business as they go as well. A couple of things before I bring Jeremy on board as well, which is that we have been operating with a totally separate uh, board throughout this time as well at Entrepreneur Resorts. There is myself, the CEO, and I've been the CEO of Entrepreneur Resorts throughout uh, the period that uh, I've also been the CEO of Genius Group. Uh, Jeremy Harris, who is the CFO, he's based in Australia, uh, and he's been managing all of our financials, our audits. Uh, we have been a public company since 2017, so you can find all of our information on the Merge Stock Exchange. Uh, we also have got Lisa Bovio, who has been our director ever since our IPO in 2017. Um, she has been a senior marketing officer for Amman Resorts. Some of you may know of that resorts is one of the top luxury chains in Asia. Uh, she was also the head of global sales and marketing at Kersner International. So if you've ever been to Dubai uh, and you have been to Atlantis, the Palm, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, and most well-known uh, hotels in uh, in uh, Dubai, that is a Kersner Hotel, and she was responsible for the launch of that hotel. Uh, she also has been commercial director of lastminute.com, so really understands the entire uh, international and online side of growth as well, which is how we built our membership site. Dennis Dubois, on the other hand, he's been our, uh, um, uh, our finance uh, non-exec director. Uh, he was overseeing 1,400 hotels at the Radisson chain, uh, and more recently at Hyatt Hotels as well. Uh, and his whole focus with us has been making sure that we have a really strong financial model for growth with our licensing model going forward as well. So that brings me to the 2023 first half earnings, right? Because we've never shown this separately while we were inside the Genius Group. Uh, we weathered the pandemic where we actually closed all the venues in 20, uh, 2019, 2020 for two years. Uh, but we actually managed to do that, keep everyone on board, and then basically have been growing ever since. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I'd love to pass this over to you to just run through uh, the details of how things have gone in the first half of uh, 2023. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Roger. Uh, so uh, I'm aware that this, for many of the uh, listeners on the call, will be the first time to see Entrepreneur Resorts uh, numbers uh, and figures. And so to provide some context for this, as Roger just mentioned, the businesses weathered the, the pandemic and like many uh, hospitality and uh, resorts and, and accommodation businesses, uh, there is still a recovery uh, occurring from the pandemic, but we're definitely seeing that recovery being very strong in 2023. On the slide we've got here on the right-hand side are our official uh, financials that were filed with the merge exchange in the Seychelles. Uh, just recently. So this is for our first six months of 2023. But we've given a summary of the highlights on the left-hand side there. And in particular, uh, we're, we've got a comparison of the two six-month periods, six months, uh, first half 2023, as against the first half 2022, uh, six months. Uh, and so we can see there 2023, just over 3 million in revenue, as against just under 2 million for the same period the year before, with our gross profit just over 2.5 million at 82%, uh, as against 1.3 million at 68%. And what's really encouraging, uh, although not a large profit, we, uh, we saw a profit in uh, the first six months of 2023, which is the beginning of a trend that we're seeing 
uh, as against the losses for the previous couple of years uh, during and coming immediately out of the pandemic. The final line down there on the left-hand side, our EBITDA, uh, we have a, a positive EBITDA, uh, again, as against a negative for the same period uh, last year and for the full financial year of 2022. And, and Jeremy, if I can add one thing to what you're sharing as well, you know, anyone who's looking at this massive net profit, uh, net loss in uh, last year, this was directly related to the adjustments made by the auditors of Genius Group across all the companies as a result of the very low share price at the end of the year, which effectively was writing off all of the goodwill that took place across all the different acquisitions and companies. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, it, it brought down uh, the, uh, the balance sheets uh, far lower than it would have been, would have done if we hadn't had such a low share price at the end, or Genius Group hadn't had such a low share price at the end of 2022. Um, and maybe you wanted to speak a bit to that as we go on to the um, asset side here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks for that, Roger. Uh, we see that in the profit and loss numbers and also here on the balance sheet as well, where we've got uh, growth in our assets uh, and positive equity uh, on the bottom line. And that is without then revaluing the businesses back up again, without restoring any of that goodwill that was, was previously written off, uh, which was required to be done under accounting standards. Uh, but uh, but so it, it reflects just um, that right off still, but we're experiencing a positive increase just off the back of uh, positive trading for 2023 so far. Uh, so, so we then, have to, yeah, do you want to mention more on this? You want me to go to the next slide? Uh, next slide, yeah, please. You there, Jeremy, we have the next yes. slide up. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, oh, yes. So on our, uh, then our uh, liabilities are uh, over, are reducing. Uh, and so overall, uh, the equity is uh, positive now, 273,000 positive as against uh, 74,000 negative, which was the end of December uh, 2023. Uh, sorry, end of December 2022. Uh, so uh, good to see the balance sheet strengthening as well. Uh, so uh, then for the remainder of 2023, what we're seeing is uh, our forecast for revenue for the full year, full financial year 2023, is between 6.8 and 7.2 million, which will represent a 46% growth 2023 year on year. And uh, we're expecting an EBITDA result end of financial year of uh, between half a million and uh, 600,000. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, and uh, if, if I could just uh, add to that for um, everyone, we are seeing uh, dramatic growth. It, it is unusual for uh, a company, a hospitality company, which hasn't been opening new locations uh, to see you know, this kind of level of growth, uh, which is all happening organically through the different uh, programs that we're actually running. Uh, and based on our capacity, we do have the ability to continue to see the scale, which obviously goes straight to the bottom line as we go forward as well. Um, so let me go from this uh, picture of where we currently are within Entrepreneur Resorts to our future growth plans. Um, so on the growth plans for where we want to be uh, building the uh, resort uh, chain, we actually are seeing this in not just what our, our plans are for the management, but also in terms of the demand that we're getting uh, from different entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, this week, again, good example where we've got all these entrepreneurs that are here at Vision Villas, and many of them are now wanting to take this concept back to their own cities and countries around the world. And so, for example, we have an entrepreneur here from Mauritius who now is looking to take this back uh, towards basically Mauritius. We've got the same, you know, happening with uh, uh, teams here from Vietnam, uh, from teams here in Japan. Uh, and so this really does mean that uh, the synergy between the type of people that we are bringing on board and the kind of people that want to actually launch these, uh, this actually is a really nice virtuous cycle that's taking place. Um, the three different models, like we mentioned, we have the Genius Central model where we're running programs consistently. We have got the Genius Cafe model, uh, which can be uh, done in partnership or in license together with uh, hotel chains. Uh, and um, as you can see here, these different programs we've been fine tuning uh, in such a way that we can now bring on board licenses. Uh, and we actually have a plan at this point of 50 locations for our Genius Central brand and 250 locations for our Genius Cafe brand. And we already have got licenses that have been signed up. 
uh, that are going to be growing now that we actually have got a full focus uh, on the company. And we're also uh, really for the first time in several years able to raise funding separately for Entrepreneur Resource as its own public company uh, than what uh, was the case before when it was under a parent company, uh, which had its own uh, focus on its uh, funding priorities. Similarly, on Genius Resorts, uh, we have got now uh, resorts that are coming to us looking to actually sign up um, as a Genius Resort as well. And uh, we are seeing all sorts of retreats, which aren't just entrepreneur retreats, but yoga retreats, health retreats, uh, which we're also attracting in as well because of our facilities. Uh, and we see this now scaling so that we're looking at 25 locations uh, that are going to be licensed all around the world, which is also part of this platform. Uh, we do not see any other resort chain uh, that is uh, at this point copying our model uh, and going out to build a reputation uh, as a location for the digital nomads and for the entrepreneurs uh, that we have as well. And over the last two years, a big focus has been on building our development system in terms of the uh, uh, the build and grow process when we actually convert uh, one of our cafes uh, or one of our resorts into a genius resort. Um, the technical service assistant, we have a team that actually delivers on all of this as well. Um, and then we also have got, in addition to a build out process, uh, we also have got a digital operating platform uh, where we have got all of the um, elements from the Genius U app, which links in partnership with Genius Group. So we're working at arm's length with Genius Group on partnerships, including events, uh, including using the Genius U platform to connect community together. So when you go into one of the locations, you can find other like-minded entrepreneurs that you can work with, or you can build your team uh, through the platforms we have, connecting people to their passions, to their purpose. Uh, and all of this basically gives us a really powerful way to not just partner uh, with the likes of Genius Group, but other education companies where each one of our cafes um, or locations becomes uh, a micro school in its own right. Uh, so you can be sending your kids to one of our locations for them to have summer camps, for them to be having after school activities, um, and at the same time, having adult learning where we're actually running uh, programs where people are integrating the latest technology into their platforms. Um, and this also is going to be linking to Genius Group's Genius Metaversity concept off the back of this as well. Uh, finally, in terms of operating fees, when we are building this out on a license model, we are more competitive than uh, others that people might be looking at building as a license. And so we do believe in the future that people have an opportunity to go and set up a Pizza Hut or a Starbucks or McDonald's, or they can come and get the healthy food and the lifestyle and the higher yield that they can get with Genius Central. Um, that more and more uh, different operators may come and choose us. And that is our ambition. So to give you an idea of venues under offer at the moment, right? there is only just one in the US at the moment, but uh, we believe there are going to be more. Uh, we already have got a number like, for example, in Athens or in Tokyo uh, that we're very excited about um, as uh, upcoming uh, locations that you can be looking forward to as investors within um, Entrepreneur Resorts. Uh, we will be doing updated uh, investor calls as we go forward, where we'll be sharing with you the developments uh, for all of our investors as well. And that brings me finally to the share count side. And I want to explain this from the entrepreneur resource point of view. Again, everything I'm going to say is not um, as a representative of Genius Group. Genius Group will have its own updates and in its own time. But I want to be sharing from the point of view of entrepreneur resource and the fact that the entire spin-off process was for us to get a full share count where we could then have all the bona fide uh, investors of entrepreneur resorts receiving shares uh, and we'd also have real clarity in terms of just how many shares were short sold or not delivered. Um, and so basically, we worked together with our experts, with the lawyers, uh, expecting that when we got to the 31st of August, uh, it would be pretty natural or normal that we should be able to get a full share count uh, of exactly how many shares uh, were sold, uh, how many were delivered, uh, who actually held those shares as at the 31st of August. Uh, as a CEO of Entrepreneur Resorts, it was my expectation that that's what we would have received. However, there have been complexities between uh, both upstream exchange together with the DTCC. And just to explain this process, because uh, even um, you know, as, as a CEO of, of a public company, it's not easy to really understand exactly what is or isn't possible, especially if what we're trying to do is something which isn't that normal. So what would normally happen if we were giving out a cash dividend uh, is the DTCC would basically uh, go out and say to all the broker dealers, uh, we need to know basically who do you have um, on your books that have shares as of this date, uh, they all deserve to get a particular dividend. And it would normally be um, the broker dealers themselves via the DTCC who would then 
distribute that dividend. Now, when you're dealing with cash, when you're dealing with something which is a book entry, uh, that should be a fairly straightforward process. However, we're not dealing with cash in our case. We're dealing with an actual share or shares um, in a company which is not listed uh, in the US, right? It basically is shares in the merge exchange uh, and it is shares uh, which need to be distributed into uh, some kind of portfolio, uh, which is not necessarily the same as the one that your broker dealer has. So that complexity of basically, could we do it? Could we not do it? Would it actually work? Would it not? We are currently still in the process where we are trying to get the clarity on exactly how many shares are out there, because at this point, the DCCC has no obligation, uh, in, in their words, to be giving us information when it comes to the short selling. That conversation is ongoing. Entrepreneur Resource has to work via Genius to get to that information. And so while we're disappointed we don't have the full details yet, as it says here, we are 100% continuing to pursue all the avenues to ensure that we do have it. Um, as you heard with what Wes shared earlier, what we can do legally, what we can do uh, by management, uh, there are different things we're learning as we go and things that we found out, frankly, only after the actual 31st of August in terms of what was and wasn't possible. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we basically are working very hard to make sure that we can get that final clarity uh, and get that final count uh, for all the shareholders as well. Uh, so rather than just going out with a statement to actually explain this, I want to explain this personally myself, uh, that this is disappointing, but at the same time, we are committed to make sure that we continue uh, to get the clarity on exactly where uh, our full share count is, and more importantly, who our shareholders are. Um, so that full list of all the shareholders and how much each one owns, uh, the easiest way for us to be able to get that while we're going through this process is to ask all shareholders who have not yet claimed their shares to claim them. Because if for any reason you happen to have shares which were sold to you that should not have been sold to you, we will find that out when you claim and we find that you're not on uh, the list of uh, shareholders uh, that we're receiving from different uh, broker dealers. So that's the biggest thing I can say is that this is a joint effort between our investors and ourselves to make sure we get the full clarity as we go forward. Um, but that is the update on the share count, where things are at the moment, and the fact that this is an ongoing process that we're going to continue to commit to. And in the meantime, while that's taking place, um, I'm giving my full commitment, as you all know, together with our management team, to ensure that we continue to grow our companies healthily. Uh, and we do this in a way that's going to be of high support to all our investors, all of our partners, all of our team, and all of our customers. Um, with that, I want to come over to Jeremy, because we have been here now for an hour we went on a little bit longer for um, Wes, uh, but Jeremy, I wanted to come back on any particular questions that people may have asked so we can cover them uh, before we close this call. Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Roger. A uh, couple of questions here. Um, who is your competition and uh, are you doing as well or better than them? Uh, yeah, so um, we don't see any other company that is currently branding themselves as an entrepreneur resort group at this point. Um, so we don't see that there is anyone who's direct competition from that point of view. If we were looking at the people that are booking up uh, in, let's say, for example, South Africa for our resort there, uh, or booking up for um, our, uh, our resource in Bali, you could argue that if people are coming for other reasons than for retreats, uh, then we have competition because people are coming and actually staying here or, or, or running you know, conferences as well. Uh, what we see is that our capacity and our, uh, at the end of the year, we'll give more details on things like our occupancy rates. Uh, we see them definitely much higher. You know, we, we, like this last month, we were at very close, definitely over 90%, very close to 100% occupancy all the way through. Um, and frankly, we're at a point at the moment where because we're running such large um, events, even the 100 people that are here right now um, we have had to actually partner with hotels in the surrounding area for over 50% of them staying at different hotels. So we're effectively giving our competition, our business uh, in partnership uh, and working with them in collaboration uh, rather than in competition. So that would be how I'd answer that one right now. Thanks, Roger. Uh, and uh, two more. Uh, one is, uh, is uh, are you going to, uh, going to rebrand uh, Genius Resorts and Cafe since it's no longer part of Genius Group? Uh, the Genius name uh, uh, is is uh, is a, a name that I uh, personally uh, really believe is a big part for where we are going for the future. I actually have a new book that's coming out, which is called Genius Generation, uh, which is about the fact that we are uh, shifting to uh, a new way of thinking about um, 
humanity itself and those who are looking to make changes. Um, we are living in a world where we're divided by our differences when we could be living in a world where we're united by our uniqueness, right? The whole idea of genius comes from that saying, uh, everyone is born a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll go for its whole life believing it's stupid, right? So if there's an education system or there's a social media system that basically has us all comparing ourselves to each other based on our weaknesses, uh, everyone loses. But if we can find ways that we're igniting each other's genius, where we're finding out what are our passions, our purpose, what are our talents, what's a smarter way for each of us uh, to be able to actually follow our own self-awareness path and our own self-mastery path, then of course, we're all going to be able to uh, have a far more effective future together. So we're going to continue with the Genius Resource, the Genius Cafe names, because it's using that concept of genius. And similarly, Genius Group will be also be using that name moving forward in terms of uh, Genius U, Genius University, Genius School, um, because it all basically falls under that same philosophy. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, some questions around opportunities to invest in entrepreneur resorts and, uh, and what are any future plans for listing on uh, other exchanges? Uh, very, very good question. Uh, we are not looking at just uh, staying on the upstream uh, exchange uh, platform. Uh, it is, uh, we believe, a good way for all investors to be able to like, really see the shares that you have, uh, know they're your shares, you know, know that they've got a code on the blockchain as well. Um, but we do want to dual list. Uh, we are looking at other exchanges outside of the U.S., uh, you know, the US, uh, the, the, the Australian exchange is one that already uh, we've approached and has approached us. There are a number of exchanges in Europe, which includes the London Stock Exchange. Uh, and we certainly look um, at potential acquisitions going forward as well for entrepreneur resorts. Um, and definitely, uh, we would say that for all of our investors, uh, you know, the liquidity that will be available in the future for our investors, we believe will be increased uh, with our plans, uh, which we'll be sharing more of in the coming future um, of uh, dual listing onto a more liquid exchange. Okay, uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, and just to address uh, some questions that are coming through around uh, the uh, process of claiming the shares, uh, we'll be reaching out to the partners that are involved in that, just to unblock any uh, any holdups that are involved in that. That's great. Okay, well, well thank you very much, Jeremy, for sharing. Uh, I know Wes has stepped off, but thank you very much to Wes for giving an update to everyone as well. Um, final thing I'll say is that we're in here for the long term, as always, uh, and we appreciate all of our investors that also are here for the long term um, and, and really believe in the same mission uh, that we believe in, uh, that education itself uh, can make a huge difference to the world if it's done right and if it's done in a way uh, which is uh, mission focused and enabling us uh, to be able to live with integrity, uh, to be able to build trust in communities um, and to be able to work with others uh, to be able to actually make uh, this is a net positive world for everyone. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, team. Uh, thank you, investors. Uh, and we'll catch up with you on our next call. All right. Bye for now.